so now I'll introduce our next speakers. So our second presentation is by Haroon Youssef and George Kapos. Haroon and George are PhD students at University College London, advised by IC3 Associate Director Sarah Michael John. And I will turn it over to you all. Great. So I'm Haroon Youssef, and I'm here with my great colleague, George Kapos. And we'll be presenting our work on an empirical analysis of privacy in the Lightning Network. Um, this is done in collaboration with uh, many of our amazing peers, as you can see on the screen. So we know that Bitcoin is um, not private and there's been many scientific papers which have proven ways to trace coins between users and also linking services together. There's also been a lot of extensive work on clustering algorithms, which looks at who owns what address and which services own which on wallets. Of all of these resulted in a new privacy focus where coins were developed, which seemed to solve these kind of problems such as Monero and Zcash. But these were also fraught with issues and some of them were not as private as they originally seemed to have been. In addition, we know that Bitcoin is not currently scalable. It has some scaling issues and is nowhere near the high, um, high throughput of like larger systems such as like Visa. But these, all of these have all contributed and led to a new off-chain scalable on payment systems, which seem to address the issues and they've called it the Lightning Network. Now the Lightning Network has a number of uh, properties. The first one is channel secrecy. This aims to ensure that users are, which are involved in like private channels are only aware of its existence and that public channels, th those who open their channels and close them are remain secret. We also have third party, um, party balance secrecy, which says that even though the total capacity of a public channel is um, known, the exact individual balances are unknown. The third is off-path payment privacy. Here it says that um, any node that's participating in any, any particular payments shouldn't really know anything about it other than who the previous and the um, senders are, which um, relates with on-path payment anonymity, that any in intermediate nodes which forward payments shouldn't know anything other than who they sent it, who they sent it to, and who they got it from. So the uh, main contributions of our paper is we broadly look at looking at special ways to attack or find issues in these four privacy properties. For the channel secrecy, you create a, a, a property and tracing heuristic, which looks at private channels and identifies, at uh, most cases, one of the participants. And we, in we, uh, third body party balance secrecy, we look at doing some sort of balance inference attacks, which um, uses an, uh, a variation of the old attack in a novel way, which lets um, an attacker actually find out the balances without relying on any messages. In off-path payment privacy, we do, I do a payment detection attack. And then on path, we do a payment discovery attack, which will be described um, later on. So we'll first start off with a small background of the Lightning Network for anyone that's not familiar. So we have two people, Alice and Bob, and they want to transact um, coins with each other. They can do two ways. One, they can do many Bitcoin transactions, which are very costly and take a lot of time. Or they can create a Lightning Network where they create a funding transaction, which is a two of two multisig. And here they put their coins in an escrow. This is then pushed onto the blockchain. And once pushed on the blockchain, the channel has been committed. Now, both of them can then send coins to each other using the channel um, as many times as they'd like. For example, in the first case, Alice has one Bitcoin and Bob has zero. They send them back and forth. And eventually now Alice has 0 0.2 and Bob has 0 0.8. Now each transaction that they do with each, with each other are called off-chain commitment transactions. They only occur between the two parties. Now let's say they finish and they want to close this channel and take the funds out of the escrow back into their wallets. They can do that by creating a closing transaction. This is um, broadcasted to the whole to the network, and once and the blockchain acts as some sort of um, intermediary and a verifier. For example, let's say Alice is trying to cheat Bob, and Alice was claiming an older version of the transaction, saying, "Oh, she has 0 0.4, and Bob has 0 0.6." Bob had a chance to refute this and send an, a newer version of the commitment um, to block Alice from doing so. So uh, the network has two types of channels, public and private. In the, the public channel we've described on the left, everyone knows the public channel. It's known to the whole network. The capacity of the channel is known. Anyone can use to route, as long as you can, can connect to the peers. And when you close the channel, the person who takes the funds or the percentages of the funds are remaining anonymous. Now, in a private channel, only the participants know the network exists. The capacity is completely hidden. Now, um, the participants can share this channel to their friends, and then their friends are then able to use it. And just like the public channels, um, when you close the channel, the person who takes the money is unknown. 
So now that uh, Harun has described how two uh, peers of the Aligning Network can share a channel, let's take a broader view of the entire network. So let's assume that these are our Aligning peers, and these are the public channels that those peers share. As we said, there is a different uh, second type of channel, the private ones. So let, let's assume that this is our view of the Aligning Network uh, we have. The first thing to notice is that not every single pair of peers share a channel, but that doesn't mean they cannot communicate even they don't share one. This is happening through HDLCs or hash time lock, con lock contracts, which um, in a nutshell fall, um, work in the following way. Charlie, who wants to be the receiver of the payment, creates a secret X and calculates the hash of X. He then creates a message we call an invoice and he sends this invoice to Bob, who is gonna be the payer in this case. Bob is, Bob's responsibility is to find the path between him and Charlie that can facilitate this payment. And this path needs to be crafted in such a way that every intermediate hop between Bob and Charlie will have enough outgoing balance in their channel in order to facilitate this payment. So basically HTLCs provide two very important features. The first one is, as we said, is that they enable peers that, are not, uh, that do not share a channel to send money to each other. The second feature is that intermediate hops that are um, involved in a payment cannot cheat in the sense that they cannot receive a payment without doing their part as well, which is forwarding the payment. So before diving into the privacy properties, um, we would like to motivate the importance of studying them. And to do so, we're gonna compare the tracing of Bitcoin in uh, the actual Bitcoin network and in Lightning. So in the Bitcoin network, we have the following scenario where Bob gets hacked by Eve and Eve requests some uh, ransom in return. Bob will create a Bitcoin transaction in order to send those coins to Eve. And this transaction will be completely transparent. Everyone with views of the blockchain can see this transaction and follow it. Let's assume that Eve wants to use an exchange in order to monetize her stolen coins. And in this case, she will again create a Bitcoin transaction to the exchange which is again um, transparent and everyone knows the origin of it. So what happens in real life is that exchanges usually run the anti-money laundering policy and they, uh, the exchange will see that the funds that they received from Eve are actually stolen coins. So, so they will inform a law enforcement agency and they will ac uh, act accordingly. They are, will either uh, reject the payment or they will accept it, but give some information to the law enforcement agent in order to capture um, Eve's identity. Now let's see why this operation would be difficult to happen uh, to do in Lightning. In this case over here, Bob is sharing a public channel with Eve and his goal is to um, find out who is Eve interacting with. Now, if Eve is sharing a private channel with Charlie, the answer we're gonna answer, the, the question we're gonna answer is whether um, in Bob's eyes, this private channel is visible and not only uh, Bob can uh, realize the existence of the private channel, but realize all, also the participants of the private channel. A second very important question is uh, for Eve to be able to infer the balances of Alice and Bob, which is you know, a, a channel she's not involved in. So as we'll see later, this is also very important. A third question is um, when Alice and Bob are involved in a payment by being subsequent nodes, whether Eve, who is not involved in this payment, can infer that Alice and Bob are actually forwarding, forwarding payments to each other. The last thing we're going to see is when um, Eve creates a, a transaction and is the sender, we want to see whether Bob, who is the intermediate node in this case, inter intermediate hope, is able to infer that the, the payment he's being asked to forward is on behalf of Eve. So we want to figure out whether it's possible as an intermediate hope to uh, guess who the sender of the payment is. Um, thank you, George. So as previously explained, we mentioned that channel balances are only known by their channel participants. So that of course means, means that they keep their privacy when they transact with one another. And they also keep the privacy of any payments that they forward. But there is some cases where an active attacker wants to try to de-anonymize the channel. There was a previous attack that was mentioned where what happened was um, Alice and Bob would create a channel between one another. 
And one way to attack this channel would be for an attacker to join up to Bob and then send messages through Bob to Alice. And if any of the, mess um, any of the hashes failed, Alice would um, send a coin, sorry, send a message back um, um, claiming this uh, property. These are the four privacy properties of channels and how they differ between each other. So we know that all channels are completely indistinguishable from each other, private or public. We have a list of all public channels. And we also know, have a known time period. And we also can derive features that are unique to channels that are created by the Lightning Network. These are features on chain that are created by the transactions by forming private or public channels. So with these, we can attempt to create what we call a property heuristic. What this heuristic does is that this looks at to explore whether or not we can identify an upper bound of private channels that exist using on-chain data. So what we did was we create, we first used the time period and noticed that from January the 12th to September the 7th, this was when the Lightning Network was active from 30 from January the 12th and the period ended where we stopped um, collecting data on September the 7th. Some of the opening features for the channels, we found out that at most 99% of Lightning channels that are created have two outputs. We also know that a single output in the Lightning channel has a pay to witness script hash. And also this output at maximum in many of, in 99% of cases received at most 0 0.16 Bitcoins. There are a couple of more features, but we don't initiate all of them here. But using these and we combine them together, we can find out that um, there's 267,000 tra um, transactions which, believe, which have the features of opening channels. If we filter these with the features of the closed channels, we believe there are around 77,000 possible um, open and closed channels, which are not public, so which we believe could be private um, channels. Um, the next part of the heuristic is we looked at the tracing heuristic, and then um, we merged these two together. Um, and by merging them together, we found that there's run, there we identify 79% of channels which had one participant. And of those, we found um, public nodes. We then repeated on the public chat on the public network and found that we we're able to determine which of the nodes in a channel opened up the channel. And of the 155,000 um, channels we finally found 155,000 that were responsible for the channel and 143,000 we able to determine those who that closed the channel. So now that Harun described how we use the property heuristic in order to determine an upper bound in the existence of a private channel, now we're going to see the tracing heuristic that basically tries to find the, those uh, candidate openings that, that for which we are mostly confident about. The methodology is the following. Uh, we identified on chain all the openings and closings of the public channels. We clustered them together. Um, we clustered together channel openings and closes, the closings on the basis of a common wallet that operated them. And we identified the lightning entity uh, of each cluster. So in this case over here, uh, we have uh, um, two public uh, two openings of a public channel that are represented by the blockchain transaction one and blockchain transaction two. So the lightning information, uh, the information we get by running a lightning node is the following: the public channel one was opened by other Alice or Bob, uh, because these are the two participants of the channel. Similarly, the C2 was opened by other Alice or Charlie. As we mentioned in the channel secrets explanation, uh, we should not be able to distinguish who opened both of these channels. But if we look into the blockchain information we get from these uh, transactions, we get the following information. The coin address one was used to open, the public, the, to, to open channel uh, C1. Also the coin CH1 was used to open C2. But doing some very uh, simple uh, blockchain analysis, we can figure out that actually the coin CH1 is the change that is created by blockchain transaction one. So basically the owner of address one is the same as the owner of CH1. So basically channel C1 and C2 were opened by the same Bitcoin wallet, which means that they were opened by the same lending entity. So Alice opened both of these channels. This behavior can be extended to many transactions. And in particular, we saw that uh, in, in, uh, in the blockchain, we saw Lightning entities creating those peel chains of opening transactions. So in this case over here, there, we have a, such a peel, peel chain where Alice opened C1, C2, and C4. But among those transactions, you can see a newly identified C3 that was not in the set of the non-public channels. And it also satisfied all the criteria that Harun mentioned 
during the property heuristic. So using this uh, tracing heuristic, we not only identify C3 as a candidate transaction, as a candidate private uh, channel, but we also have a very high confidence in identifying it. And we already know at least one of their participants, Alice, because she's the one that actually opened it. In order to identify now the second party of the private channels, we looked into the closing transaction. In this case over here, uh, the closer of private channel three was uh, actually opened uh, channel five and channel six during the same intersection attack. We figured out that Dave is the opener of C5 and C6, which means that Dave is the second party of a private channel. So in terms of our results, we were able to narrow down the more than 70K um, the candidates we got from the property heuristic to a bit more than 27,000. And out of these private channels, in uh, more than 79% of the cases, we were able to identify at least one participant of the private channel. In 7.5% of the cases, we were able to identify both of the parties. And in more than 36% of the cases, we were not able to identify um, uh, either party. In terms of the public channels, in 89% of the cases, we were able to break the channel secrecy uh, heuristic uh, property by identifying who opened the, the, um, the channel. In more than 77% of the cases, we were able to identify who closed them. Um, cool. Cool. Sounds very cool. So, we've, as you previously explained, we've shown how a channel secrecy can be um, unfortunately damaged. In this case, now we're going to look at ways which we can identify finding out the balances that are hidden that are up to, or up, that are hidden away from the public network, but are known to the small individuals open or sorry, open or involved in the channel. So. We'll first explain a briefly a privately oracle attack. Unfortunately, the slides don't seem to be showing the present the animation, so I can't show it to you now, but I'll just I'll briefly explain it. So a previous version of this attack um, was published on very recently. I did a lot, lot last year with a number of papers and another one a couple of years before. In this case, we have an, an intermediary Alice, and she wants to um and sorry, Eve, and she wants to identify the balances between Alice and Bob. What she would do is she'd open up a channel between Alice, then she's route a fake payment hash through Alice to Bob. And then once Bob received this, if he does receive it, he will then unable to claim the hash because the hash that he received is fake. We then send a message back through the chain, which we received by Eve, claiming that um, this, this is an error. Now, this small um, technicality in the protocol means that Alice, so it means that Eve is able to identify the balance. So if she, for example, sends a message through um, Alice saying that I, I want to transfer 0 0.8 Bitcoins to Bob, Bob obtains the hash and is unable to claim the coins and sends a message back saying, I cannot claim these 0.8 Bitcoins. Eve then knows is Alice has the ability to forward 0.8 Bitcoins. And this leaks out key information about who has what balance in the channel. But the issue with this attack is it's heavily reliant on error messages, which can be patched through um, an update. So what we explain is a generic version of this attack, which we call the generic balance inference attack. So here, for example, the attacker selects a target. In this case, this target is Alice and Bob. On the blockchain, they know the capacity of the channel. The attackers are also communicating with one another. So they know that they're expecting a message, doesn't matter what it is, just a single message to be received. Eve on the left then routes a fake pre-image with a random amount through the node, which goes through Alice and Bob and is supposed to be um, expected to be received by her other node on the other side. If this node receives, them, receives this message, and it contains a pre-image that they um, knew about earlier on, then they know that this channel is able to forward such an amount and therefore they are able to determine the balances on each side. However, if this fails, and for example, even the right side does not obtain the hash that she was expecting in a short amount of time, they can then they, um, they can ignore any, any other error messages they received and just repeat the attack again with binary search. Now, because um, the attackers are not relying on error messages, they're actually relying on the specific hash received and they know what it's going to be as this was um, totally showed through the, um, through the link before. This is a slight improvement over the previous attack. So we performed this attack on every single node in the testnet. Um, we funded two nodes and we attempted to attack all channels. Of the channels that were available, only 103 nodes we were able to connect to, which was around 3% of the testnet. Um, of these, this was 1,017 channels, which are approximately 11%. Um, although we find that not all channels 
are active or respond to any of our requests for channel openings. And what we found was 65% of the channels in the test net were in fact one-sided, meaning the balance of the attacked party was 70% or more of the total capacity. Now we might here mention some of the attacker cost. Um, on the test net, the coins are in fact useless because you can just mine them yourselves or have them sent to you from a full set. But if you were to do this on the main net, you would need to also um, purchase liquidity. And we estimated that you need approximately one Bitcoin's worth in able to um, make channels and purchase liquidity to yourselves. And then we're using this hold over 109 Bitcoins worth in channel escrow alone to be able to attack the entire network. So the next um, idea is we're gonna talk about off path payment privacy. So here, oops. In this case, we know what the sender is. We know the receiver and we know the amount. Now we want to extend the previous balance inference attacks to occur on the entire network. So can we now use it to, in fact, infer the payments that are forwarded between different nodes? So the idea here is simple. We will take we take two snapshots of the network at two different times, and we run the balance inference on both of these snapshots. We then decompose the graphs into paths that have the same value. We then use this to try to identify the path that end payment endpoints and the edge value that was being sent. So for example, in the, on the left side, we've got snapshot one, which we take a balance, um, a, a balance inference attack on. And then snapshot two, we do the exact same attack on the same router node, just a short time after. So the results were we run this, we ran this through a simulation. We chose a random set of senders and receivers with a small amount of payments to try to simulate a worse case scenario. Um, so for a snapshot, which was around with 30, sec 30 seconds of difference, we were obtained a recall of 66%. Um, but to recall that this attack doesn't need to really target the entire network. You can just also just make it very similar and just target a small subset of nodes. So now we're gonna describe how we build, uh, build our own landing network simulator in order to describe our last observation regarding the all path discovery. So uh, when we build a simulator, we try to follow a best case, worst case approach scenario instead of trying to find the most realistic simulation. So we run, we created two simulations, long and short. Well, when we uh, run long, we try to maximize the length of the paths that the nodes took in order to perform payments. And at the same time, we try to minimize the probability of a payment failing due to insufficient balances. When we, run, uh, when we created length short, we try to achieve the exact opposite. So one question may be here, why did we not try to find the most realistic simulation instead of finding these two edge cases? Well, the reality is that in order to do the latter, we required significant resources, and we had to make assumptions regarding the network that uh, are unknown. So let's see how we created those two simulations. The first type of parameters are, is, uh, are the node and network parameters, which is information that can be obtained uh, in the network. Such information is the topology, the uh, capacity of the channels, and the fees the network charge. Uh, a second type of information is the geolocation of the, of the nodes, which is based on their advertised IP addresses. Lastly, we simulated the TCP delays between the nodes based on the geolocation and the global IP latency provided from uh, Verizon. The second type of parameters is much trickier and that has to be simulated rather than uh, actually uh, scraped. So with the first uh, type is the payments endpoints. This parameter defines who is the sender and who is the receiver of each payment. We have two distributions. Uniform means that when we choose the sender and, and the receiver, this happens completely randomly. When you use the weighted distribution, you choose a sender and receiver randomly, but you take into consideration the number of channels these nodes have. So basically, the more uh, channels you have, the higher the probability of being chosen as a sender or receiver. The other parameter is the payment values. So again, we have two distributions, cheap and expensive. When we use chip, the payment value of a payment of uh, the payment value is the smallest possible value a sender can uh, can give out based on the on its current balances. Expensive means that the payment is the biggest the sender can send. So how these uh, parameters fit into our simulation? When where we try to maximize the paths, we use uniform for payment endpoints. When you use uniform, the, then you have much less routers chosen as payment endpoints. Routers are nodes that are extremely well connected to the network and cause uh, paths to be very short because of their connectivity. So uniform endpoints means less routers, which means longer paths. When you have cheap values, 
then you uh, minimize the probability of failing due to insufficient balances. In order to run length short, we use the exact opposite parameters. So these are our results. Although we cannot uh, argue about the most realistic average path of the length, we can um, argue that the smallest possible, um, the, when, when you try to maximize the lengths of the paths, even in this case, at least almost 15% of them will just have one hop between the sender and the receiver. When we, you try to minimize the paths, more than 56% of them will have only one hop between the sender and the receiver. So let's see how this information, um, we can use this information in order to argue about the own path relationship on a moment. So this privacy property ensures that an honest but curious intermediate node cannot argue about who is the sender and the receiver of the payment. So our game is to find the sender. The game to find the receiver is uh, very similar. So the, the adversary strategy is always to keep his, um, is always to guess that the sender is the node before him. So the predecessor node, this is his guess, his guess every single time. The threat model says that the adversary needs to keep uh, his channels, uh, his channels balanced. So the question is, given this uh, scenario, how often is our adversary right? Conceptually, when you have only one hop between the sender and the receiver, well, how often is the adversary right? Always, because uh, always when there is only one hop between the sender and the receiver, the predecessor of the intermediate hop will indeed be the sender. When there are two hops between the sender and the receiver, uh, the probability is not 50% as some one may think. It depends on other stuff as we will see later. So this probability can be extended for up to 20 intermediate hops between the sender and the receiver, which is the maximum that lining allows. So the probability of the adversary being right is two probabilities happening at the same time. A path needs to have a length L and simultaneously, our adversary needs to be the first hop among those intermediate hops. In this case, he is right. Let's try to calculate the first part, which is directly extractable by the graph we made earlier, because this probability says how possible it is that the length has a particular value. And as we saw, this probability ranges from less than 15 to more than 56%. The second probability can be calculatable in two scenarios, which is basically how often is our adversary the first hop among all possible hops? Well, the lower bound case says that when the adversary has the chance of being wrong, he will always be wrong. So basically, whenever there are at least two hops, he will always be wrong. There is a second uh, calculatable case when all nodes within a path form a click. In this case, it is equally probable to be in any uh, possible hop. So the probability of being the first hop is one divided by the number of total hops. When we fed those um, uh, probabilities into our calculations, we saw that in the worst case scenario, the uh, intermediate node has less, a bit less than 15% of being right, which is already uh, uh, very high. So this case is basically when, our, um, when we try to minimize um, our paths and these are, have still only one hop in between the sender and the receiver. But in the best case scenario, when the paths are short, the failures happen often, and the nodes form a click in a particular payment, then this probability goes up to 83%. So although we cannot argue which is the exact number, this uh, probability ranges from 15 to 83%. So it's for sure higher than it was intended when lighting was uh, designed. So we hope we explained uh, the four main privacy properties in lightning, and we showed how we try to um, tackle each, uh, each of them. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I have a question, if I may. Yep. Hi, Sharon. Hi, George. Thank you for the presentation. Yes. Um, yeah, I have a question regarding the proven tag. Uh, one question is, you mentioned that you have time delta of 30 seconds, that you simulated the taking snapshots 30 seconds apart. Um, how realistic is this in the real network setting? Because I can imagine that there are latency when you send a message some time passes before you get response. So how, how realistic is that? So in terms of the off path, off, uh, path payment, that uh, we have some details in the paper regarding the, the trade-off between how often you probe and how often, how good are gonna be your results. Uh, it is true that the actual probing will take some time 
uh, which will be maybe uh, may add some delay in these 30 seconds. So in 30 seconds, which is you know the edge case when we say we try to do it as fast as possible, maybe in real life you have to basically add the factor that you're going to have some problem delays. Um, to be honest, we didn't implement this attack in the main as it would probably uh, an escalate and it would require extreme resources, which we did not did not possess. But if you try to um, realize it in a, um, an actual scenario, I think you should indeed add some delays regarding the probing. Thank you. Um, a, and the second question that I um, had uh, also regarding the uh, probing, um, as far as I understand, you establish channel directly to the victim. Uh, can't you? Um, like, why is it necessary? Uh, can't you establish a, a channel to some, say, payment hub and then send payments towards some remote target uh, channel a few hops away from you? That's a very good question. And yes, of course, you can do that. You can just purchase um, some sort of liquidity to a hub and then target channels away from it. The only issue with that is, as you, um, as you know from testing network, there may be problems with the route, for example, you might not know that the route between you and the, the intermediary or you and the pro provider may be correct. But the route between the provider and the third party may not be correct. That person might be offline, person might be invalid, so you won't. But, so by simply doing this attack, and we, if you do not rely on any of the error messages, you won't know if the party created was secure. So the, for, from our perspective, one way to do, for me to know for sure is to connect on both ends. But no, you can definitely make a, sm a more cheaper version and simpler version by just connecting to payment hubs. Okay. I think one of the issues I found when trying to like measure a lot of the network was a lot of the nodes, especially in the mainnet, didn't want to connect to me. If I tried to open a channel, they would just refuse. Many of them said were, they were online, but when I attempted to ping them, they were not online. Um, and I, I'm so this is quite strange considering everyone is supposed to be online all the time. Thank you. Someone wrote a question in the chat. Is it possible to find historic public channels from um, Remco? So there is uh, some websites which have open data sets which you can download um, historical channels from. You can also attempt to use the heuristics to identify what channels could be private channels. Though the only problem with that is you won't know for sure unless you scrape the network at that point in time. Can I have a quick question uh, with regards to channel secrecy? A really nice talk, thanks a lot. Um, yeah. So my takeaway message I want to validate um, with you guys is that uh, all this, uh, what you did can be mitigated if you fund the channel with from a coin join transaction. Uh, would you, so my takeaway message is that uh, you should always fund a lightning channel from a coin join. Would you agree with this uh, takeaway message or not? If you, uh, so basically if you, when we run the property heuristic that Harun, um, that Harun mentioned, no matter how you're going to fund it, it's going to be visible because no matter where your funds come from, even if it's from a coin join, the transactional probabilities will be the same, the outputs will be the same, and most probably you're going to see the amount of seed that's going to be eventually spent in the closing up in a very specific way. So you will not, um, it will not be, uh, it, won't be, it won't avoid capture using the property heuristic. Regarding the tracing heuristic, it will not uh, be validated. So basically, if someone uses a coin join to find the private channel, we will uh, this analysis will be able to capture it with a certain uh, probability. It's not going to be a high one because the association of this private channel will not be with any other logic activity. Now, if someone finds a private channel from a coin join and then uses the closing output to find other channels, then the tracing heuristic will be able to capture it as well. Thanks. So the takeaway message is true, but only for private channels and not for public channels. The takeaway is that uh, if you use any uh, you know, privacy mechanism in order to find the channel, uh, it will be captured with a lower probability than if you use your normal Lightning wallet. Uh, but it is, and this is the first takeaway. And the second takeaway is that if you take uh, great care in opening the channel in a private way, make sure you take which when you close it as well. So don't open it 
from a conjoint from whatever privacy mechanism. And when you close it, don't use it for any other lightning activity. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, George, and thank you, Haroon, um, and thank you, Yen, and to everyone who attended. Uh, IC3 hosts monthly research webinars. The best way to find out about them is by following us on Twitter. I've just put the link to our Twitter in the chat, um, and I hope to see some of you all at our future events. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thanks for having us.